Building a team capable of competing for a championship at best is at best a puzzle. Finding the pieces that fit together perfectly is difficult for even the most talented of general managers. Now, when the Milwaukee Bucks chose a smooth six foot six swingman out of Norfolk State in HBCU in the fourth round of the 1969 NBA draft, an immediate impact was not expected. But Bob Dandridge excelled at both ends of the floor, blending his skills with two different sets of future Hall of Famers to create a pair of championship caliber teams. Fourth round rookie sensation, Bob the Greyhound Dandridge. One of the NBA's most versatile forwards in the 1970s, Bob Dandridge played a crucial role for two franchises that went to four NBA finals. Walt Frazier have the round prize snatched away in the closing moments by the league's new super thief, Bob Dandridge. After a standout career at Norfolk State, Dandridge was selected by the Milwaukee Bucks in the 1969 NBA draft. And right away, he was a seamless fit. His talent was immediately obvious. You know, he could play at both ends of the court. Dandridge. Feeling it and dunking it at 6 6. Bobby Dendis was the next uh, offensive link in the chain. He was very adept, making good plays for us. Bobby Dandridge shoots it. Bullseye! Dandridge was a key member of the Bucks' 1971 championship team. And when he joined Washington, he helped the Bullets win it all in 1978. He was really a super intelligent player. Dandridge came in and made us better players. Dandridge jumping to Alvin Hayes. A four-time All-Star, Dandridge scored more points in the NBA Finals in the 1970s than any other player. Bob Dandridge should be remembered as a great all-around player. Offensive defense, someone who really complimented the teammates that he had no matter where he went. Welcoming Bob to the Hall of Fame is the big old Oscar Robertson. Let's hear it for Hall of Famer Bob Dandridge. I think I'm going to take a longer breath than the two young ladies that preceded me. First of all, I'd like to thank the God of my understanding for his grace and mercy. Mercy is just a gift from God. It has nothing to do with anything that I did or anything that I deserved. I also want to thank the Veterans Committee for seeing fit and clear to elect me to the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame. At the same time, I'd like to congratulate the other inductees into the class of 2021. And I think this is going to be a lifetime bond, whether y'all like it or not. <laughs> I bring to this celebration my village of friends, classmates, teammates, coaches, mentors, neighbors, and friends of youth that I have trained and coached. A Hall of Famer once said, this Hall of Fame achievement is not for me. This is for my family. This includes my aunts, cousins, uncles, nephews, grandparents of all, both sides of my family. I think about the sacrifices that my parents, Dorothy and Robert Dandridge made to make sure that my sisters, Patricia, Robinette and I had the tools to flourish, not for a short time, but for a lifetime. My grandmother's favorite cliche was, be thy labor great or small, do it well or not at all. 
And this verse still resonates with me on a daily basis. A few of y'all out, out there may know that living with an NBA player is difficult as a wife or as a child. The opposite of that is try living with an in, try living with a retired NBA player. I am blessed with two amazing daughters whom I love, Shana and Morgan. I have a wonderful, passionate son who is a great father and a husband, Savard Davis. His wife is just unbelievable because she manages a house with three males in it. I sometimes say three young kids. And I am blessed to have two world leaders, future world leaders as my grandsons, Zachary Davis and Thaddeus Davis. Where would I be without my lovely, beautiful wife, Deborah? You know, a, a couple of things happened when I met her. And amazingly, I met her when I was in the NBA and I would go back to Norfolk State and I saw this cute young lady walking across the campus and I said, who is that? But I knew that I didn't have a shot at her. She had too much class. She had too much style. Why would she want to date me? Well, I had to keep it moving for another 18 or 19 years. She is the coach of my family. She's the boss of the family. And she keeps me, whenever I think about doing something ungodly, she reminds me of the blessings that the Lord has just overwhelmingly shattered on me. One of the main things she told me when we got married was, I'm not cooking. I'm not cooking every day. And before I met, met her, I was like a deer walking into some bright headlights. I've had tremendous coaches in my life. Where would I be without the coaches? And my father had enough faith in his ability to be a father that he entrusted other black men to coach me. Never came to a game because he was too busy working at the railroad. And I was sort of, from time to time, mischievous in school. And when I went back, teacher called my house a couple of times. My father said, if this guy calls this house one more time, I got something for you. <laughs> and what he had for me was he worked at the railroad from 11 o'clock at night until 6 in the morning. And what he did was lifted 100-pound sacks of mail, mail that was going from the south to the north, and he took me to work that night. I'm about 6'3", about 125 pounds. And after being out there an hour, I was in tears. Thank God that my mother loved me because she came and rescued me and laid me and laid him out. But he kept lifting that mail. He kept lifting that mail. And the coaches I've had, like Russell Williams, 
seventh grade, eighth grade coach, never played me not one minute. But he's the best coach I ever had because he taught me the fundamentals of this game of basketball. And my fundamentals carried me for 13 years in the NBA when other folks didn't know nothing about fundamentals. There was also my high school coach, Stretch Gardner, George Johnson, Larry Costello, Dick Marta, Bernie Bickerstaff, Hubie Brown, and a guy named Tom Naselke. My college coach was a guy named Ernie Fears, godly man. When he recruited me to come to Norfolk State, he asked, asked my mother two questions. Is it okay if I reprimanded him? She, she was 75% there. And then he said, is it okay if he goes to church every Sunday? And she looked at me and she said, you're going to Norfolk State. <laughs> and, and Norfolk State to me was just a building block for me. Uh, I grew up in the Richmond Public Schools during a time of segregation. But at no times did my teachers expect anything but the best from me. I grew up during a time when sports in high school were not integrated nowhere in the state of Virginia. In fact, college Athletics for African Americans, especially coming out, out of the South, we had limited. We were limited and we were fortunate enough to have the historically black universities up and down the East Coast. I played in a conference called the CIAA. I mean, there were schools like Virginia Union, Virginia State, North Carolina A&T, North Carolina Central, Shaw, Livingstone. Some of you may not have never heard of the schools individual, individually, but I guarantee you've heard of some of their graduates. My experience in HBCU school was not limited basketball. If it were not for schools like Norfolk State, I would not be standing here before you tonight. The, the, the skills that Norfolk State provided me went so much further than just basketball. I saw what having class was like. I witnessed dignity and a sense of belonging. Even in the NBA, teammates used to joke me, oh, you went to Norfolk State, you went to a black school. And one thing about it is when we traveled around the country, there were always young people there college graduates were, would always come to the games, and guess what? They were paying fans. They never asked me for complimentary tickets. It, it, it was just amazing that because I attended a black university, that automatically gave them access to me. And for me, that was my foundation. And Oftentimes, even now, former players say, oh, you played with a chip on your shoulder. You were an angry player. Well, when I look back on it, 90% of the guys that I guarded or was pitted against are in the Hall of Fame. So you don't look forward to guarding Connie Hawkins, Elgin Baylor, Rick Barry, all in a period of four days because it, it was no such thing as uh, time management or whatever you call it, <laughs> you know. And to me, being a Hall of Famer is not about basketball. 
And y'all know I've had to wait a little while, but there's been so much growth inside of me that I'm real grateful for the wait. I've had a chance to be a better father. I've had a chance to be a better person. Some of the grudges I had against some of the guys I played, played against, all of them are gone. And, and sometimes I have to listen to some spiritual music. And one song that comes to mind is Faithful by Marvin Winant. And when we talk about God's goodness and faithfulness, that means he's faithful to me. He's been faithful to me on a daily basis. I look forward, and some days I wonder where has this peace come from? I, it's, it's a peace inside of me that I can't explain but what I know is as I learn more about from where my health, health cometh, I'm cool with the weight. I'm real cool with the weight. And when I say I'm cool with the weight, it is that doing the weight in collaboration with the NBA, I, I, Bob Danvich, bought the concept of rookie orientation to this league. And that, that concept is being used in all of major sports over the last 30 years. And anybody that's come into the league since 1994 has been a part of a program that Alex English allowed me to develop, which was then the Nike 100 basketball camp. Now it's considered the top 100 basketball camp. And if any of you young guys are sitting in here and you got the exposure, it's because of the work of myself and Alex English and the NBA Players Union. And I'm a firm believer as I close out, things happen in God's time. All I got to do is wait on him. And the things that he wants me to have, he's going to give them to me freely. But I got to be able to work on, to wait on him to just wait on him and in the meantime, to still do good. And I encourage anybody that if you have any type of pl platform, we are obligated to stand on something, be it mental health, be it the right to vote, be it social justices, and I am just ecstatic. And I brought with me some folks from, you know, I'm so blessed that I got folks from all over the country that loves me. And it wasn't until over the last 10 years doing the wait that I realized that love is real. And only through me loving the God of my understanding am I able to feel love from others. What can I say? I don't need to recognize this guy, the big O. Everybody in the building know him. Isaiah Thomas told me a couple of years ago, you are the only person that Oscar has ever said is, your, is his friend. <laughs> and, 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 and I've played with some great players. I think the prompter has hit it double zero, <laughs> triple zero, 
So it's time for me to get out of here. And may God bless each and every one of you.